Okay, so we are here with Denise Van Oppenbergen, Senior Manager, Climate and Sustainability with Ellis Don. In her role as that Senior Manager, Denise works on identifying, defining, and implementing Ellis Don's climate commitment to low carbon agenda at a corporate and project level. This includes focus areas such as reducing carbon emission from Ellis Don's own site operations, building materials, as well as the operations of the project projects built. As an experienced project and program manager with a background in municipal public policy, consulting and in-house, she, in, she leads internal and external stakeholders to find common ground and work together towards decarbonizing the built environment. I think it's interesting actually that you, Denise, come from the municipal public background. Does that help sort of connect the dots on this subject pretty well, eh? <clears throat> I'd, I'd say a Part little bit. Um, I definitely think that it helps give a bit of a holistic understanding. Um, that municipal background is from the Netherlands, though, so it's a little bit different regulations from, from Canada, but it definitely helps give that policy understanding. Right. Yeah. Good stuff. Okay. Well, the screen is yours. Um, have at it. Perfect. Thank you, Chris. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having me here. I'll, as Chris mentioned, I'll try and give a bit of a lay of the land of what's happening in the in the sustainability world but primarily focusing on carbon because that's really kind of like the the big buzz of today um and really trying to give an idea of where we're at in the market um and how we as Ellis Dawn are approaching it if there is ever any kind of like terminology that I'm using that might not be as familiar, please do let me know. And I can definitely give like a bit of an explanation to that. I'll make sure I feel like sustainability is a little bit of like the abbreviation world. So I'll make sure to kind of stay away from that, but please let me know if there's already kind of unknown terminology or unclear terminology. Um, but yeah, so today what I'll be focusing on really is trying to give a bit of a lay of the land of what's happening in the market right now when it comes to the built environment and real estate specifically. Um, what are some of the commitments and regulations that we're seeing out there? What is driving it? And then how does that translate down to project level requirements, specifically focusing on concrete as well, because there is where we're seeing like the, the biggest kind of steps having been taken in the last couple of months, couple of years. And then kind of wrapping it up with how we as Alice Dawn are approaching it as a company. Um, so then also for further context, Alice Dawn is a construction services company with over four and a half thousand employees and about like five billion in revenue. We're focused on um, or provide the role of general contractor, but also construction management. Um, also often do the financing of projects as well as have the some of the facilities management role at the end of some of those projects as well. Um, so yeah, then when it comes to the wider context starting there, so taking it really wide at first when it comes to kind of the climate commitments that are out there. Um, so Canada has signed on to the Paris Agreement, which is the international treaty that's really kind of committing all of the countries that have committed to it to limiting global warming to one and a half degrees above kind of pre-industrial levels. What that means is that in practice to stay on track with this and to kind of stay within the total you know, planetary limits on carbon, we need to reduce our annual emissions kind of by 40 to 45% by 2030 and reach net zero by 2050. In practice, this means that we really just need to re drastically reduce emissions in the short run um, and balance any of the remaining ones that are still outstanding with high quality carbon removals. The construction and building industry is particularly impactful in this area. One, because we're growing as an industry. We're, I don't know, I'm, I'm based in, in Toronto and I think I, I just have to look out my window and I see quite a, a plethora of cranes in the in the sky. So it's kind of one of those things where there, there's a lot of construction happening. So, and it's increasing as well. So that's the main thing. And then in practice, we're also kind of responsible for about 40% of global emissions. That is taking into account um, 
So that's construction and buildings, not just the uh, construction operations itself, but it's also the emissions that are associated with the materials that we're using, as well as the, the energy consumption when the buildings are actually in operations. All of those emissions combined are responsible for about 40% of global emissions. What that means is that we need to kind of address our processes and really find, find innovations to support decarbonization across Canada and across this sector specifically. Um, we know that there's certain sectors that are going to need more time, whether that's steel and other sectors that are maybe a little bit further ahead, like concrete. Denise, you mentioned, a, mm -hmm. I think you said quality carbon <clears throat> when you were speaking to point number two. What do you so, quality carbon as opposed to bad carbon is there? Mm -hmm. So that's referring um, to specifically high quality carbon removals. Um, so I think there is a, so it's not carbon itself, it's more the removal process. We've been seeing a lot around carbon credits. Um, it is a little bit of a gray area right now that's not very well regulated, um, but there is an understanding in the industry that Obviously, the focus is on reductions, and we need to reduce our emissions probably by like 90 to 95 percent. But there is also some carbon that we're just not going to be able to remove just by getting more efficient processes or by switching fuel and those things. So for those, there is a bit of an allowance for or an understanding that we'll need carbon removals, but with a focus that they need to be high quality, whether that is carbon capture or other processes, but it wouldn't be acceptable to just do to plant trees in an area where they may, might not be permanent because then it's not actually going to be a long-term carbon removal so that's where the high quality ties into okay thanks for clarifying so if we're looking at some of the drivers behind what's really Kind of driving that decarbonization in real estate specifically or in, in infrastructure as well but we're seeing it more on the, on the real estate side um is primarily because we're also seeing a really an increase in demand from both the public and the private sectors but especially also on the investor side um so this graph is from jll research from 2021 so i expect the numbers to be even higher now but what it's showing is really that over half of investors have either already committed to or are planning to commit to some form of net zero commitment in the near future. Um, whether that's science-based targets or, or the, the net zero asset management framework, there's, there's lots of different kind of frameworks or commitments that are out there. Um, but the common denominator is that they all include net zero targets and that it also includes scope three emissions, which is considered the value chain which means that it's really also construction operations and carbon associated with materials that are looking for carbon reductions. This in turn is kind of driven by a couple of different factors. Um, primarily that there is increasingly a financial business case for it with the caveat that like this is still increasing and there is still a little bit of a bit of value engineering that you can see at a project level, but at least at a corporate level, we're seeing increasingly that there's a business case for it, primarily because tenants are really asking for it in buildings. Uh, tenants have their own net zero commitments and the performance of the buildings that they occupy matter. We're seeing this in, um, for example, in the public sector, the federal government, they have certain mandates for the buildings that they're occupying think by 2030 actually that they need to be net zero um, and we're seeing this for certain kind of like leading um, private sector a uh, public sorry private sector clients as well then we're seeing it also on the regulation side that's driving it for example um, building performance thresholds around kind of building operations that isn't new. We've had those for, for years, but they are becoming more stringent and they're also increasingly including greenhouse gas metrics and max levels that you can have. Um, there's also increasingly regulations and kind of like requirements around 
embodied carbon disclosure, so the material carbon. Um, we're seeing that in Toronto, we're seeing it in Vancouver, that they have maximum thresholds that you need to, that or right now it's disclosure and soon it will be maximum thresholds that you need to meet. Um, we're seeing it, as I mentioned, like the investors are valuing it. They're worried about carbon emissions becoming a liability and their assets becoming stranded and they're not able to, to lease them out anymore. There's some conversation as well around kind of like energy reliability and, and grid relate resilience and really having kind of like diverse energy sources that is also kind of tied to geopolitics and not necessarily wanting to be as dependent on, on oil and gas and wanting to maybe focus a bit more on more local production and like focusing on electricity and renewables and the independence there. And then also not specific to real estate, but like more generally, there is the the talent retention and recruitment aspect. We can definitely see it when it comes to our current employees and any kind of like potential employees. We're having or we're being asked more and more questions around what are we doing in this space because employees are looking to work for a responsible company and want to have like an impact in their work as well. So we're seeing kind of like the the soft and the hard ask increasingly come up. On the client side and the investor side as well, there's increasingly kind of like reporting requirements. It's through kind of a number of different avenues. Some of them are voluntary where clients are just asking the questions. Some of them are actually regulatory based. We see this especially in, in Europe where they have the SFRD kind of like disclosure regulation that's coming into place where companies have to disclose on their emissions. We're seeing it um, likely come into place in the US in, in the, the short term where the SEC is having requirements around any of the companies listed needing to disclose on their emissions as well. So basically what we're seeing is both at a voluntary and a regulatory level, increasingly these questions around companies to disclose their information. And that is driving them to then understand at an asset level what the environmental impact is, because that's all kind of combining together in their company disclosure. So forgive me for my mm -hmm. uh, probably ignorant question, but so Elathon are building a huge hospital mm -hmm. and you're expected to quantify the carbon footprint or the emissions that come from the whole process of assembling that that uh, that building from digging the hole to putting the roof on? So that is what is starting to come. I wouldn't say it's like fully there yet on all projects, but we're starting to see it on some projects and our expectation is that that's increasingly going to be asked. That, that's so the goal. That, yeah, that's the goal that we are able to track all of the carbon associated with everything from the extraction to transportation of materials to all of the fuel or electricity that's associated with the construction until it's delivered to the clients and then kind of like onwards the the building operational emissions as well interesting so that's actually a great tie-in because that leads me to the kind of project level requirements what all of this kind of like more this wider landscape is and meaning in practice um Briefly touched on it already, where it's like we're increasingly kind of seeing regulation around this. A lot of it is currently focused on on disclosure, but we are moving towards having kind of like maximum thresholds and like actually needing to have reductions in place. A lot of it is currently focused on it's either the building operations or it's on the materials aspect, and then really focus on structural materials often. Um. But they are increasingly asking for the construction site emissions as well. And then also are increasingly asking for as-built reporting. Because to date, a lot of the material reporting is based on whatever the building is designed to be as. But we're also kind of getting an increased awareness that let's look at what actually is happening on site. Like, is there... 
more concrete delivered to site than was actually needed? Is there issues with performance? Like what is the waste in materials? And we should be accounting for those emissions as well. So that's kind of an ask that we're starting to see and that we're then kind of bringing to our trades to track as well, because we need to kind of track those material quantities coming in. Years ago, I heard a horrible statistic. Um, I'm, I'm originally from the UK, and this, so this statistic came out of the UK that 40% of, of materials on a, on a construction site are wasted. Mm -hmm. Seems a little large. I don't know, but that seemed to be, um, came from several sources, a massive amount of waste. This is back in the 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the motivator to reduce waste, I mean, because that's got to be a, a huge um, contributor to the problem. Mm -hmm. So the motivator to reduce waste and improve standards, I mean, we're all about quality assurance for flooring in our, in our organization, must be a really driving, hopefully a driving force to make it more efficient because construction is notoriously inefficient. No, and, and that's the thing where it's like, I think it's an area that has been ignored a bit to date. Um, because I think, as you said, like it's been quite an inefficient processes and there haven't necessarily been as much um, or as many consequences to being that inefficient in, in materials. Besides, obviously, kind of like obviously wanting to have cost efficiency, but it's it's not been that. Yeah, there's not been as many consequences of it to date. And I think that's something that's increasingly that, getting awareness. So all that waste just goes into a landfill. Mm -hmm. That's um, yeah. Sorry, carry on. No, no, but that's great. And it's actually, it's interesting because I'll touch on that a little bit at the end because we're increasingly seeing, right now the the focus has really been carbon and it's something that's really come up in the last couple of years, especially when I'm speaking about Canada specifically. Um, but this year we're hearing a lot more and getting a lot more questions around circularity and waste as well. So it's definitely something that I see getting increasingly a focus in the next couple of years. Did you say circularity? Circularity, yes. Um, so circularity kind of focusing on really moving away from from waste and making sure that we're not having as much waste or whatever we have as waste that that's kind of can be used by other sectors. So and it's reused so and it's not going to landfill. Circularity associated with recycling. Yes. Mm -hmm. we, yeah, okay. But it could also be kind of like the reuse of of buildings or kind of setting up, designing buildings in such a way that they're flexible and could be used for other purposes and kind of having that wider context there as well. Yeah, good point. Design of flexibility is, yeah, as opposed to just a rigid one-use product. Um, mm -hmm. Generally, yeah. it's been quite like a ri rigid process mm -hmm. because it's we've never really had to think as much about this and i think it's increasingly we're seeing clients ask questions around it yeah cookie cutter construction is kind of in the past almost so it's got to be very uh, well it's got to meet so many different needs these days mm -hmm. no definitely yeah okay um so yeah i think all in all kind of like these regulations and client questions we're seeing are driving us to something that's called kind of like whole, a whole building's emissions profile or like a whole building life cycle assessment. And it's really kind of showing that we need to look at carbon or building holistically and not just what's kind of been in the past. It's looking kind of like at operational emissions. Um, so this image, really what it's showing is kind or very high level, like the different phases that fit into like a whole kind of building life cycle when it comes to carbon. Um, it's looking at the product stage. So that's really getting the raw materials. It's the manufacturing of it. Um, then looking at the construction stage where the, the materials being brought to site and then it's installed on sites. It's the use phase, which is your traditional kind of like your building energy consumption, electricity, natural gas, or whatever system it has. Um, it's the maintenance and repair that go into that. And then there's the end of life stage, which traditionally has been kind of like deconstruction, demolition, and kind of like the waste process. Um, so 
all the bits that are in yellow. So product, cons product construction and love life. And then also a little bit of that maintenance and repair that's considered embodied carbon. And then operational carbon is really kind of like that, that other use phase, the operations phase. Um, the operations phase is by far the biggest contributor at the moment in, in your average building. Um, but obviously, as we're moving to more efficient buildings, less carbon intensive buildings, more electrified buildings, um, that proportion is going to go down. And the relative proportion of the impact that the carbon as part of the materials specifically is going to go up. Um, so that's also why that increase that in awareness is going there because there's a realization as well. We've had a lot of focus on getting more energy efficient buildings and getting those kind of fuel switched. But kind of in the past, we've gotten a little bit about the materials and that is going to be increasingly a big impact to have. So what are we seeing when it comes to kind of like the reporting expectations right now? We kind of divided into a couple of different sections. So it's the materials, it's the construction on site, and then it's the kind of corporate level um, requirements that we're seeing at a project level. Um, I would say in general, the, the trend that we're seeing is a lot of it right now is focused on disclosure, but it's increasingly shifting towards actually showing reductions. Um, so if we look at materials specifically, it's been focused on building as a whole disclosure. We are starting or increasingly getting questions around actually showing some reductions um, specifically based on the design. And they are asking us increasing up to report on, on as built conditions as well. And we are expecting to see increasingly kind of maximum global warming potential limits. So carbon limits really for the whole building. Um, when it comes to site, really, it's been kind of like an increase of awareness, um, asking us questions to disclose. We are expecting uh, them to actually be asking or clients to be asking us to report on our fuel use and transportation kind of coming up. And then ultimately, also, we expect there to be maximum emissions associated with projects. We're starting to see that in a sense, um, there was one specific project um, RFP that came up where they weren't necessarily, like we've seen several RFPs where they're asking us to tell, to tell them how we would be implementing sustainability initiatives on sites, but not necessarily helps to a specific reduction. Um, but there's also increasingly projects where they are asking um, to really, so one project I have in mind is where they were asking us to include a fee or, or budget for, for carbon offsets in this case. So that is really, we would have to project the emissions that we assumed were going to happen with this specific project when we were constructing it and then tie a, tie a price to that to be able to offset it. So we're increasingly seeing that question around there's actually a, kind of like a fee associated with how much we're emitting, because obviously if we're emitting less, we'd have to buy fewer carbon offsets. So we are seeing kind of like a shift in that direction that it is becoming less of a disclosure thing and more of a reduction thing. Um, then at a corporate level, what you're asking on, on a project level um, is that they... We're increasingly having clients that are asking us as part of RFPs whether we are tracking our emissions. Um, one of the examples actually being the, the federal government. So the Treasury Board released a, a standard that any vendor that's with a that they give a pro, um that they give a contract to over 25 million, which would be a lot of the kind of like the buildings or infrastructure that we would do for them would need to have, so any vendor that would be part of that or get that contract would need to have corporate um, emissions tracking and science-based or, or valid kind of like 
reduction targets in place. So that's something that they're setting as a kind of like a requirement now for companies to have. Um, we have another client that is asking us for a specific questionnaire. In this case, it's, it's called Ecovadis. Um, and we need to meet a certain or achieve a certain score for them to consider us as one of their vendors, as one of their contracts. So we're increasingly seeing some clients ask kind of questions around or making decisions based on sustainability requirements as well. What we're also expecting to see in the future is kind of like increasingly having that like capital tied to emissions performance, um, both at a project level and corporate. So we can see it, for example, um, RBC has sustainability linked loans already that are tied to a company's corporate performance or whether or not they're meeting their targets. Um, basically getting more beneficial financing if they do have ambitions target, ambitious targets and they're meeting them. And then if you don't meet them, it would be penalized. So we are increasingly seeing kind of like that financing tied to it as well. In practice, what that means, like I tie or touch a little bit on that like whole building life cycle assessment already, which is basically like a whole, it's, it's a report. It shows kind of uh, all of the emissions based on like the materials that you're using. Usually it uses estimates based on construction and then it has like the, the operational emissions associated with it as well. But how do we actually build that whole building life cycle assessment with a focus on materials right now, because I think that's something that would um, tie to the most to kind of like the people on this call. So we build that whole building life cycle assessment based out of EPDs, which are environmental product declarations. That environmental product declaration is really a product specific, manufacturer specific, um, document that includes information on the environmental impact. You can also get industry averages. So we have different associations that have kind of like grouped together to, to produce them, like specifically thinking of the, um, the concrete sector or the cement associations. Um, but we basically need those product specific EPDs to build a bigger whole building life cycle assessment. Otherwise it's pretty much all just based on estimates. This is just kind of an example of what it is. An EPD is really just kind of like a nutrition label, but for your specific product. So based on the production process, based on the materials that are going into it, based on like how it's all kind of put together, it, the emissions or the other kind of like environmental impacts associated with the product are calculated. And it's really a way, so it, there's the ISO standards that are set for it to be able to kind of compare different products against each other so that then designers or clients, um, whoever is purchasing the project products can then also actually make a decision based on it because it needs to be comparable. I wonder how, <clears throat> I wonder how many flooring products have one of those labels. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting to see. I'm trying to think, um, we've definitely seen some out there. Um, I would say, I'm trying to think what is an example. It'd be is interesting if anyone on this call knows of their kind of products having it. Would this influence a sale? Uh, this opportunity here, if you have this display to make it easy for you guys to calculate your carbon footprint on a project, um, mm -hmm. you know, is this going to uh, encourage the specifier to use that product over the next one that doesn't have such information? I think we're increasingly seeing it. I I can't say that it's going to be the only deciding factor, no. um, but I do think we're increasingly seeing it, partially because of the, um, the carbon aspect that's increasingly being pushed, but also from from <clears throat> LEED certification, because they are really asking for a certain number of, um, products in the building to have these kind of EPDs available. So that's what we've really seen kind of cause like an uptake in the market over the last couple of years as well.
So from that perspective, yes, I would say if if all else considered is the same um, and one product has an EPD and the other one doesn't, it would influence the kind of procurement decision. All that's going to happen is the specifier is going to say, go get this information so they can go back to their tech um, departments and, and uh, get that information and bring it back to, to satisfy the need. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, Jay Jackson, can you hear me? Is it? Jay, if you're on the call, yep, I can hear you. Are, you. are you familiar with such a label, the EPD? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, Tarquette, of of course, uh, has been uh, publishing EPDs for years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. All right. Good to know. Um, I did then briefly also want to touch on like some examples from the concrete industry <clears throat> as well. Um, just to kind of see how like one specific industry has taken this up. Um, we've seen concrete or the concrete industry in general be one of the sectors that's taken it up the most, I would say. Um, also because they do already have processes available that are making kind of like the less carbon intensive products available like yes there is obviously there is a requirement for innovation but there's certain things that are already kind of widely available um some of those examples would be portland limestone cement rather than traditional portland cement it's using a higher percentage of supplementary cementitious materials rather than kind of like uh, cement or clinkers and it's also there are some more kind of innovative solutions like carbon cure, like carbicrete, which is looking at like really kind of like injecting or baking in carbon into the process as well. Um, the Global Cement and Concrete Association has set up kind of like a a roadmap to net zero, kind of showing the the levers that need to be pulled pulled in order to get there. Um, a lot of that also has to do with kind of like efficiency in design and construction. As mentioned, it's not always been the most efficient processes. I think there's a little bit of a, um, this is how we've done, let's continue to do it this way. But actually, there are a lot of efficiencies that can be found in the design alone. Um, there's obviously efficiencies that are needed in production. Um, there is kind of like savings in cement and then clinker. A lot of that has to do with SEMs or with the supplementary cementitious materials. It's looking at carbon capture. Obviously, there's also the, the wider thing. Yes, we can electrify our processes, but if the grid isn't or is very carbon intensive, that's not necessarily helping things as much. So that's a bit of like a wider kind of policy governmental change as well. Um, and then it's also like kind of like the, the CO2 sinks kind of like recarbonation aspect to it. We which ties more to kind of like some of that injection or like baking in carbon as well. What we are doing as a contractor, for example, is really trialing and, and, and testing these new procedures and being able to inform the client as to what are the lessons learned? How can we best implement this on a project? So for example, um, having a, or focusing on high volume, um, SEM concrete, which you basically have kind of like SEMs at about 70% compared to like your, your average project product, um, would actually equate to probably up to the kind of like 20% emissions reductions already. What we have found is that, generalizing it, but what we've found in general is that the product is actually more durable, it's better quality, um, there was a lot of kind of trial and testing and collaborating with the suppliers, with, the, with us as a contractor, with the owner, to make sure that we met the overall project expectations because there can be kind of cost and schedule imp implementation, sorry, cost and schedule effects. Um, but it's really one way of kind of showcasing how we took what is available, kind of tested it, made sure we had the lessons learned, communicated it with the client, and were able to then kind of implement that on site. Another example here is really to kind of showcase what we are getting as a question from clients. So this is from a project's, 
project out in BC where the client really came to us to kind of like understand um, what drives concrete emissions, what can they do to procure lower carbon, what would it mean to their schedule and like their overall cost. Um, and we really made sure that we, as a sustainability team and like kind of like we have a building a material sciences team that have a couple of concrete experts on it, uh, worked with estimating to make sure that we figured out kind of like a, a bid leveling process for carbon that not just included costs or schedule, but that also included um, carbon, sorry, a bid leveling process for concrete, uh, but that included carbon next to a schedule and cost. Um, so it gives us just kind of comparing a couple of different companies and their different products that they had available and like looking at what actually would work for this project in particular, what was also okay, okay with the client, were they okay with a potential kind of schedule delay, if it would really reduce the carbon, obviously there's costs associated with it as well. So that's still kind of like a conversation that's happening, but really it is the main takeaway from that is it's like giving us a, an idea of how we can bring carbon into that bit leveling process. And it's something that we are working with our estimating teams to kind of build out to other projects as well and make part of our regular process. So in summary, what we're seeing on the concrete side is very similar to kind of like the trends that I was discussing beforehand. It's an asking around uh, disclosure of emissions, increasingly asking us to, or having actual requirements around like the maximum emissions that we can have. Sometimes um, they also have a maximum SEM that they're allowing, and those can be in conflict with each other because the the easiest way or the, the less the easiest way and the most kind of tried and tested way to reduce emissions is by increasing the SEM content. However, if a client also has very strict requirements or specs around what the max SEM can be that limits those opportunities where we can really kind of play around with that. Can you just uh, explain the SEM uh, acronym? Uh, just give us an example of some of the materials that would, would make up SCMs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so I'm thinking usually it's kind of byproducts. So it's, it's fly ash, it's slag, um, there is a third one that is completely escaping me right now but it's often byproducts from from other industries actually that ties in with a question that clayton shaw has asked here is the canadian mm -hmm. cement industry incorporating cement kiln dust into their cement like they are in the u.s under the environmental protection agency requirements since 2019 have you any idea it's a Basically, good question so, so cement kilners cement kiln dust Kind of like a kiln recycling dust. Oh, okay. kiln, kiln, dust. kiln dust. So the the you know once the once the coal is uh, mm -hmm. uh, burnt and you got the fly ash, I guess kiln mm -hmm. dust is another byproduct. Um, uh, Clayton, correct me if I'm wrong, but that that's just a something they do in in the U.S. that they might want to do in up here in Canada if if mm -hmm. there is uh, if it's working. That's definitely a good question. I haven't necessarily heard them or seen that as commonly mentioned as kind of like fly ash or slag or things um but it's definitely something i am taking away and will kind of confirm and happy to kind of check with our concrete experts and kind of get back on that um because i would be surprised if they wouldn't if they have it available um so yeah definitely happy to take that away yeah okay um so yeah what we're really seeing then is that clients are really wanting to kind of understand what the emissions reductions opportunities are. They want to understand how that's affecting at a project level, like again, cost and schedule being the two big ones. And they are really looking to collaborate with us and have us as a contractor collaborate with our suppliers around like finding these solutions as well. Then I also <laughs> wanted to, oh, sorry, go ahead, Chris. Well, I was just going to um, sort of go on to Clayton's second comment because uh, he's heavily involved in mm -hmm. concrete production and we're trying to get more and more messages out about mm -hmm. new concrete ideas, products, technologies. 
it's hard to get these messages up through the uh, the construction channels to where they actually. I mean, imagine changing your habits when it comes to to procuring and placing concrete. It's such a risk. Mm -hmm. It's such a massive in, uh, risk investment that it's it's not surprising that there isn't much of a there isn't much change. But he says here in the USA there have been some concrete placements that have reduced the carbon footprint of concrete by fifty percent. <laughs> which is massive when you consider that is, yeah. mm -hmm. um, what percentage has Ellis Don been able to achieve in construction in Canada? Um, he asked that question. If, if you're able to answer, then, then carry on. But I think the 50% figure is, should be of great interest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, what is our, I'm trying to think what our highest would have been. Um, actually one of the highest projects um our emissions reduction projects was i think we have two we have one which was a hospital and one which was an infrastructure project um and i want to say i think one was 30 percent reduction and the other one was i don't think it was 50 percent, but it was probably 40 to 45 percent um, and that was based on kind of like primarily focusing on the SCMs. And so there is quite a bit of opportunity available there. But yeah, I don't think we've had it as high as 50% yet. Why, um, why, don't, why don't I, I'll put you in touch with, with Clayton and Bob Higgins who, who deal mm -hmm. with this on a regular basis. And, you know, uh, technologies like nano colloidal silica, mm -hmm. you may have heard of that, adding adding huge lifespan uh, to the product once once it's uh, set or poured and put in place. More durable, waterproof, that's that's the comments that we're getting. Um, so, you know, someone in your position, you might might be interested to get those contacts because they're, they're very okay. smart dudes. No, that definitely would be great because we, I think the way I see our position um, and I work very closely with our um, building and material sciences colleagues who are definitely I will admit a lot more to concrete experts than I am. Right, uh, right. But we work very closely with them because we see such a demand for emissions reduction specifically in concrete. And there's a lot of kind of like or increasingly products and opportunities out there. So anything that any of you are aware of or working on yourselves, we'd definitely be interested in hearing. Yes. Anything that um, makes a claim is of interest until, until you prove it, it can't meet that claim. But in, in the meantime, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, maybe there's something out there that could uh, improve the situation, but mm -hmm. yeah, carry on. Because we're definitely trying to push for, it's it's finding the right clients that are interested in a little bit more of the innovation and like are willing to test it as well. But it's it's one of those things where it's like, we're definitely trying to push for some more um, different solutions on site. Yeah. Yeah. Old habits die hard in construction, especially <clears throat> um, with this, the, the whole push for, reducing carbon mm -hmm. is forcing that change you know no and that's the thing and it's like we are increasingly seeing it in like the questions that we're getting but also in like we're, we're actively trying to have those conversations with our clients with um with governments or, or code setters or, or spec setters just because we see that with some of the traditional processes there are some limits and the freedom that we have to to do some of it like we we do have clients that are still very kind of spec based rather than performance based and that makes it um or sorry are very respective specs rather than like performance based specs and that makes it sometimes a bit more difficult to try some of these innovations so we're also just trying to have that conversation as an industry to to move to a space where we have a bit more of that flexibility to try obviously within reason and within safety and, and, and durability aspects um but some of the traditional processes just do not allow for some of that flexibility that we need to be able to decarbonize yeah. okay um, i just briefly wanted to end on what are we doing as a company i think it's it's kind of been come throughout this this presentation so i, I won't dwell on it too too much um, but as a company, really what we've done is we have set, we are tracking our own emissions. We have set targets to have 42% reduction by 2030, 
to be net zero by 2050. These are kind of like SBTI approved targets, which are considered um, a science-based targets initiative. I would say it's the probably leading third party verification of, of corporate carbon targets that you can get. It's a it's an independent organization that's really checking that you're including all of the emissions that you should be including as part of your your organization and that you have ambitious enough targets for your sector as well. Um, these reduction targets that we have are really focused. It's our own business operation. So it's like the, the offices that we're occupying, but really for us, it's primarily like our emissions on site. It affects the materials that we're procuring. So we are accounting for all of the emissions that we're using in the materials that for the, the buildings and the infrastructure that we're building. And we are also accounting for all of the emissions associated with building operations that we're delivering to our, or the buildings that we're delivering to our clients. So it's definitely an ambitious target. And it, the, the last two bits, like the building operations and the materials are things that are a lot less in our control. It is something that is definitely very client driven. Um, so it's it's a little bit something that in a way is out of our comfort zone because we don't have as much control over it as what's happening on site. But it's also something that as a company, we recognize is important to start the conversation and to move the, the, the needle. And I would also say when it comes to, um, to the market, it is no longer enough to just look at your own direct emissions. You need to look at your whole value chain to have kind of like acceptable climate targets. Just very high level, our emissions profile is very much dominated obviously by what's happening on our sites. And it's primarily natural gas, it's primarily fuel um, with electricity being kind of like a smaller component to that. And then really this is driving home that kind of message that I was giving where it's like it's no longer enough to just look at your own operations because for the vast majority of companies your own operations compared to your whole value chain is going to be minimal so unless you're probably like an industrial company then that's going to be a little bit different but if we look at like our whole emissions profile so that's looking at our direct activities as well as our, our whole value chain our direct activities or our construction site is really kind of only like one to two percent on an annual basis and the vast majority of emissions for us is coming from the materials that we're using and like the buildings that we're building and their operations which is why we find it so important as well to really be engaging with the industry on both of those bits So then as a company, what we're really doing is like we're holding ourselves accountable, we're calculating our own emissions, we're set, we've set the targets, um, we're really working with our supply chain to kind of build all of that knowledge, specifically on embodied carbon and like trying to push more and more um, suppliers and industries to kind of produce those environmental product declarations because it's something that we need to be able to, to accurately track and, and compare products and make decisions. Um, we're building kind of accountability within the supply chain. So what we're doing, we actually have it in our standard contract language for all of our subtrades um, that we can request um, any kind of emissions or material data or transportation data to sites, as well as whatever the subtrades are using on site fuel wise or, or kind of like energy consumption wise. Um, that's an included in all of our standard contract language. We're only really kind of enforcing it on specific pilot projects right now because we're building that engage engagement, we're building that awareness um, before rolling it out to kind of all projects. But that's something that we are really looking to roll out to pretty much like all of our vendors and subtrades. Um, obviously we're working with our clients on like helping them identify what low carbon actually means for them. Um, we have clients that come to us saying like, we want to build the most sustainable building, but need more kind of like guidance on what that actually means in practice. And how can we kind of like, what solutions can we find that like meets all of their parameters? Um, 
and then just in general like we're working with the industry at large um whether that is through kind of like different boards or committees and like really just want to share our data we publish our emissions data on an annual basis with the last year being the the first year the next year's is coming out in two weeks actually um or probably three weeks realistically um but we're really kind of pushing that transparency because that's one of the gaps that we really see in the industry is that there's just not that much data out there yet within Canada. Um, so that's something that we were really trying to like move forward. Um, obviously trying to reduce our emissions at a corporate level, whether that is looking at like our fleet, whether that's looking at our, our buildings or business travel, um, at a project level really is that kind of tying into that project level tracking and having actually tracking what materials are coming to site, what are the delivery trips, how much waste is going off, having that all kind of give a kind of total picture of carbon. And um, we're doing a lot of looking at a lot of different strategies of how we can reduce, whether that's um, fuel switching, whether that's efficiencies, whether that's uh, winter heat hoarding, um, looking at different kind of generators as well in Kind of alternatives to diesel generators. These are just a kind of a couple of examples of some of the reduction opportunities that we are really looking at on site. Um, as mentioned, a lot of it is looking at efficiencies because that obviously also helps from a cost perspective and it's an easier kind of change management when it comes to a lot of the different sites to help them kind of change their processes. It's looking at the alternative fuels really looking at kind of like biofuel and electrification. Um, it's looking at renewables on site. So specifically looking at um, solar on site trailers. We're looking a lot at that. We're looking a lot at concrete as well, specifically looking at monitoring. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of different kind of like moving pieces right now that we've really started to implement in the last year. That we're hoping to get kind of like reliable data on in the next couple of months as well. Then I did briefly want to we kind of touched on it before already, but circularity. Um, so the number I think Chris mentioned before, where it's like about like forty percent of materials on site are kind of waste. I've also heard a number where it's like that construction is responsible for. 40% of all waste that goes to landfill. But all in all, what that means is, is like we have, again, like quite a big impact just in this kind of um, on the waste theme alone to be able to get, well, one, to be able to get to true kind of like zero carbon, we'll obviously have to look at waste and have to reduce that to the extent that we can. But it's also just in general, I think there is a, there's an increased awareness that there's limited space for landfill unlimited virgin materials that we can use. Um, so it's really kind of pushing that efficiency aspect and that also that reuse aspect as well. The Clayton makes another interesting comment here. <clears throat> um, he says, I'm not confident that the industry can achieve net zero concrete by 2050. Mm -hmm. So I feel the industry will be switching to engineered wood, <clears throat> which would be mass timber, I guess, the you know, high rise is built mm -hmm. out of wood. Which is, you know, happening now, mm -hmm. has been for a few years now. <clears throat> what do you think the trend, trending structural material will be? It's interesting because, like, I would say we've been doing a lot of research internally on mass timber, and actually have quite a couple of experts that are, are really have been active in that field for a couple of years. So I definitely see it coming up. I do think that there is there's a time and a space for all structural materials. Um, I think I don't see us fully getting or not using kind of concrete or steel as kind of structural materials. Um, but it is going to be interesting to see how quick those industries are able to pick it up and how quick they are able to kind of implement some of the solutions that they're either seeing or still need to still need to find. And I think that is one of the reasons why kind of like the, 
the concrete and cement industry is also really actively looking at it because I do think that they are aware of the fact that that's increasingly a deciding factor. Um, so I would say, I do think we're, we're increasingly seeing mass timber as a product that's used. We're seeing it a lot of when it comes to kind of like institutional clients as well, like a lot of universities are asking around it. Um, but I also, I, yeah, I think I would go back to like, there's a time and a place for each of the materials, but we need to find ways that those industries can move forward. Yeah. Um, and then I just had a couple of final thoughts here because um, I recognize it's getting closer to time. Um, but I think like my kind of concluding thoughts were more around the whole kind of climate crisis and the awareness around it is really kind of like requiring a, a shift in our business practices um, and changing away from some of kind of like our traditional processes that we've had. And we kind of need to embrace it as like a an opportunity for change and not as a threat because there is quite a lot of opportunities in there as well. But it is asking us to collaborate more, to collaborate earlier, um, to be able to ensure that we can kind of actually meet the goals and requirements of, of our clients. Because especially thinking of, of that material piece, a lot of it has to do with design and taking carbon into account there. A lot of it also has to do with like what kind of opportunities are out there and then what kind of effect does it have on the project overall. Um, we also need to recognize that there are clients that are willing to consider cost increases. Like we are starting to see clients that are willing to kind of put their money where their mouth is. Um, but as long as we can kind of quantify what the co cost will be up front and what the opportunity is as well, because I think increasingly clients are seeing the, the cost sets associated with carbon as well, but they just need to have like the actual data to back it up. Um, we need to report on our emissions at a project level as well as at a corporate level um, to really kind of account for our overall impact in the building va um, value chain. And then ultimately all of this, what is leading towards is that we need to kind of move away from our traditional like linear processes to more kind of like circular and regenerative processes. I recognize that's a lot of information that was kind of packed into uh, this last hour, but yeah, if there's any other questions, happy to take them. Also happy to kind of have any questions sent to me after as well, if anything else comes up. Well, you made a friend out of Clayton Shull. He's asked if you could provide your contact information. Clayton, yeah. you'll get it. You'll get it as part of the email that goes out to everybody who attended the call. But I think this is a great icebreaker for a complicated, um, little talked about topic that you know, unless it really is uh, <clears throat> on your work desk to deal with, you really wouldn't pay it too much attention. You know, I know as a subtrace, we don't look at this stuff because we just don't have to. But uh, the constructor has so much to think about. Oh my God. <laughs> we sort of sympathize when you have to deal with health and safety, let alone carbon uh, capture and quantification. I don't know how you guys do it, quite frankly, but <clears throat> I, I love that you are doing it. And kudos to Ellis Don for um, for leading the charge, if if that's indeed what, what's taking place here. No, I appreciate it. And I think it's one of the things as well where it's like, there's a lot of... There's a lot of different teams that are or, or parts of the supply chain and parts of the of the company even that feed into it. And I think really what I see our role as for me as someone that's focused on sustainability, it's bringing the right people together. It's bringing the right people together to have the conversation to figure out what works and how is it going to affect the schedule? Is it going to affect the cost? Those aspects so that we have a holistic idea of what the impact is, and then can make decisions based on that bringing the right people together ain't that <laughs> construction <clears throat> all right well denise thank you so much uh, is, are there any questions it, you know it's tough to think about questions on this subject i you know um we've got a couple of thank yous excellent well presented 
don't know if we're going to get too many questions. Mm -hmm. I did actually have one. Um, so if you don't meet, if there's goals set for a particular project and you don't meet them, what happens? Who who smacks your hand? I, it would depend on the contract, really, if there is yeah, true. kind of contract language around it. Um, I would... Because then, for sure, if there's contract language around it, the client is is gonna use that to the best of their ability. Make um, it run. I don't care how much it costs. Yeah, basically, either you have to adjust it, or or there, there's gonna be a penalty. I would say, otherwise, a lot of it. I would say in in Canada, a lot of it is still reputational focused. Um, so as I mentioned, um. It's it's we have clients that are really looking for kind of like the sustainability leaders and looking for that guidance, looking at us to achieve what we're saying that we want to achieve. So I think that is a big aspect. So we it's an opportunity seeing... to partner. If you take it yeah. very seriously, then because this is the way it's going, it's not gonna. I don't see this turning around. It's just gonna get more and more prevalent. Yeah, because we're definitely seeing it in in Europe a lot more, and that. Uh, I I think our general consensus is that like the regulation is down the line. It's it's coming. It's just hard to yeah. say what specifically. Yeah. <clears throat> Getting ready to catch that ball when it arrives. Mm -hmm. Well, Denise, I think we should uh let you off the hook and uh let you go, get back to work and and um thank you so much for sharing your uh, wisdom and understanding on this topic. I, uh, we will. Re we have recorded this session. I'm going to stop the recording now if I can find the right button. <laughs>